The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to give it just a couple of minutes before we start. People are popping in really fast. We've got over 200 people coming today. And we're at about 66, 67 right now. So let's give them a couple of minutes to get here so they can hear the whole thing but we want to be respectful of your time as well. All right, people are populating pretty fast. We're up to about 80 of our 200 plus. So I'm gonna go ahead and start and know that we'll fill in as we go along. Uh, my name is Julie Pierce. Um, I retired earlier this month after serving 28 years as a council member and six time mayor of the city of Clayton, California, one of the smaller cities. But I also served on the Association of Bay Area Governments the Council of Governments for the 101 cities and nine counties of the San Francisco Bay Area. That's about 8 million people. And I served there for over 10 years, including four years as president. And I'm currently a member of the National Association of Regional Councils Board of Directors. We welcome you here today. Very happy to have you join us for this webinar on how to integrate racial equity into regional housing policy. This webinar is part of NARC's ongoing series of webinars addressing racial and economic equity. In these times of COVID and, and Zoom meetings, it's the, about the only way we can get together. And I think this is one of the lessons learned from this, from this pandemic is that we can do more of this and bring people from all around the, the country and the world together for these kinds of wonderful sessions. So I'm excited about this. As you all know, the lack of access for tens of millions of Americans to affordable, safe, and adequate housing has become all too apparent during this pandemic. We have watched affordable housing disappear as more and more affluent individuals and families buy up the very limited housing stock and push lower income individuals and families out. Uh, I don't know that there's any place that's more a model of that than, than the Bay Area, and we're working to, uh, to solve that. I'll be interested in hearing from the speakers today about how they're doing that. At the same time, there are tens of millions of poor and out-of-work Americans, primarily in communities of color, who've been unable to pay their rent or mortgages. These are members of our own communities who will face eviction at the end of this month when the temporary moratorium on eviction ends, unless Congress extends that moratorium. Once these evictions begin, we will see a dramatic increase in homelessness that will exacerbate the lack of racial and economic equity. Throughout today's presentation, you will learn about policies that promote regional housing equity, You'll see examples of promising work being done across the country and learn about Urban Institute data tools for decision making and learn how to unite diverse jurisdictions under one common equity focused policy agenda. Before introducing our presenters, I do want to share some information with you about the Urban Institute or Urban for short. More than 50 years ago, President Lyndon Johnson founded the Urban Institute to help solve the problem that weighs heavily on the hearts and minds of all of us, the problem of the American city and its people. The Urban Institute was born at a time of severe polarization as Americans clashed about whether and how to grapple with the country's deep legacy of racism and segregation. Early attempts to lift families out of poverty 
and narrow inequities were often stabs in the dark without a clear understanding of whether new policies were working or for whom. Among Urban's first contributions was a micro simulation tool that forecasted the combined effects of federal anti-poverty programs on family well-being. How did cash benefits, food stamps, tax credits, and other subsidies interact? Were they helping people get ahead? Since then, Urban's researchers have built a portfolio of micro-simulation models on taxes, health insurance, and retirement security. Each is built to predict how people, communities, and spending will be affected by proposed policy reforms, giving policymakers and the public crucial information to better shape and target our solutions. The presentation you're about to hear comes out of that tradition. And for those of you who are joining us today who are not familiar with what regional councils or the National Association of Regional Counties do, I'd like to fill you in a little bit on both of those. Regional councils, also known as councils of government or COGS, and regional planning and development agencies are public organizations comprised of local elected officials that promote collaboration among local governments, working across the jurisdictional silos of states, counties, and cities. More than five hundred regional councils in all 50 states serve areas with populations ranging from less than 50,000 to more than 19 million residents. So what do regions do? Regions convene local elected officials like me and leaders from member communities to develop solutions to challenges extending beyond individual jurisdictions. Regions plan transportation, environmental and community development projects, and deliver projects and programs by providing technical assistance and serving in roles such as metropolitan planning organizations, area agencies on aging, economic development districts, 911 operators, and much more. The National Association of Regional Councils, or NARC, has served for more than 50 years as the national voice for regions by advocating before Congress and the administration for regional cooperation as the most effective way to address a variety of community planning and development opportunities and issues. NARC members include regional councils, councils of government, regional planning and development agencies, metropolitan planning organizations, and other regional organizations. So with that introduction, I'd now like to introduce our presenters. Monique king Veland is the Director of State and Local Housing Policy at the Urban Institute. She leads efforts to catalyze Urban's vast housing policy expertise into actionable strategies for and with state and local housing leaders. Her portfolio extends across urban, encompassing a range of housing policies from homelessness and affordable housing to zoning reform, home ownership, and housing finance. King Veland previously served as executive director of the Los Angeles County Development Authority, where she oversaw 580 employees and a budget of $600 million. She saw this all up close. She was the first woman and African-American to take the helm of this 40-year-old agency. She led the agency through significant transformation, including the merger of the Community Development Commission and the Housing Authority into one unified agency to augment cross-agency thinking and client service to increase organizational effectiveness and reposition the agency as a forward-thinking industry leader in the provision of housing, community, and economic development. Also joining us today is Gabriela Velasco, who is a policy assistant for the Research to Action Lab at the Urban Institute and a contributor to the Housing Matters Initiative. Before joining Urban, she worked with the sustainability program at the Texas Department of Parks and Wildlife, providing research and project management support across the state. 
Velasco received a BA in Sustainable Studies, a BA in Urban Political Ecology, and a minor in Women's and Gender Studies from the University of Texas at Austin. So before handing things over to Urban, I just want to let you all know there will be a question and answer period at the end of this webinar. If you have a question, please enter it into the question box on your control panel on the right-hand side of your computer screen, or if you've moved it like I did on the other side. Uh, feel free to enter your questions at any point during the presentation. I also want you to know that the session is being recorded and will be available by tomorrow on our website, including all of the visuals that you will see today. So now that we've dealt with those housekeeping matters, I want to turn the webinar over to our presenters. And Monique, are you going first? I'll be going first. Thank okay, you. okay, very yeah. good. It's all Thanks. yours. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, for your warm introduction. And thank you to the National Association of Regional Councils and to all of you for making the time to attend this webinar and discussion. As Julie said, my name is Gabriella Velasco. I'm a policy analyst in the Research Action Lab at the Urban Institute. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Monique king Veland, the Director of State and Local Housing Policy at Urban. Next slide. So as Julie previewed, uh, for those of you not familiar with Urban, we are a 50-year-old nonprofit social and economic policy research organization based in Washington, DC. We conduct policy research and analysis, provide strategic advising and assistance to help stakeholders achieve better outcomes, and convene researchers, policymakers, practitioners, and advocates to discuss new evidence and share promising practices. Next slide. So our presentation today will begin with a brief introduction to why housing is the central focus of today's discussion. Then I'll turn it over to Monique, who will talk about why racial equity is essential to housing policy and offer insights into how organizations can pursue regional housing equity. We'll leave about 15 minutes at the end for Q&A, but if you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to drop them in the chat box below. Next slide. So it was true before COVID-19, and it'll be true after. A safe, decent home provides a solid foundation in life and strengthens more than just residents. However, housing markets don't provide safe, decent homes at all income levels, nor are they race neutral. That's where policy needs to intervene. Next slide. Learned and lived expertise shows that housing is central to opportunities and outcomes in life. Housing stability and safety influence a range of factors for individuals and communities, including health, economic mobility, neighborhood safety, educational opportunity, and well-being. Housing can also be a key point of influence to address disinvestment and segregation in pursuit of racial equity. Next slide. The range of issues that unstable or inequitable housing systems produce are wide ranging and intimately felt by residents. Acute short-term outcomes like eviction and homelessness are connected to declines in health, both mental and physical, difficulties in employment, and a reduced sense of belonging and autonomy in communities. These have impacts over a lifetime, including lower earnings, lower assets, higher health costs, and shorter lifespans. Next slide. So the Urban Institute has long been focused on these connections between housing and other domains. Since 2016, we have led the Housing Matters Initiative, an online portal for rigorous research and tangible solutions for policymakers, practitioners, and advocates. Our work makes connections between housing and a range of domains, including health, income and assets, climate change, education, and the justice system, among others. We'll drop a link in the chat later on to our website, and we encourage you to go through these resources and subscribe to our weekly newsletter to stay in touch. Next slide. So beyond its role in supporting better outcomes in health, education, climate change, and justice, we also believe that housing has a major role to play in the pursuit of racial equity. A few months ago, my colleague Martha Fedorowicz and I wrote a blog piece on why it's essential that we integrate racial equity into housing policy analysis. While this article was geared towards other research translators, 
we think the central thesis of the piece holds true for all policymakers and practitioners whose work touches the housing sphere. Next slide. So a key component of understanding the specific housing inequities a region may face is disaggregating data by race. When you see the differences in rates of eviction, for instance, among people of different races, it prompts an exploration into why this is the case. That's why it's absolutely essential that data be presented within a framing that is fully engaging with the historic and present structural and systemic drivers of inequities, including racism. If you don't have that framing, you miss the why. And answering the why brings us closer to knowing how to answer the question of how do we create policies that address this inequity. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Monique. Thank you, Gabriella. So building on Gabriella's point, let's delve into some racially disaggregated housing data. I'm going to focus on racial disparities in the housing market and how COVID is increasing housing instability for people of color and why that is the case. A few quick things to keep in mind before we jump into the data. First, the data we are sharing is focused only on rental housing. That's not to say that there's not also a looming crisis on the homeownership side. And second, we're focusing only on racial disparities in access to housing, not income-based disparities. We know that low-income renters of all races are facing crushing housing cost burdens and housing instability risks that COVID has only made worse. But while I talk about income-based disparities briefly, it will only be in the context of how they reinforce race-based disparities. Third, we're going to focus more specifically on Black-white disparities. Although disparities exist between whites and other racial and ethnic groups, given availability of data and timing, we opted to focus on these disparities. And one final point. You'll note that the slides will differ in the use of their language to describe Latinx households, often using the term Hispanic. Hispanic is a term that is rife with conflict but it is the designation used in census data. Next slide. To start, it's important to keep in mind that we were in the midst of a housing affordability and instability crisis nationwide pre-COVID. And the pandemic has only amplified existing inequities in our housing delivery systems. Next slide. Black households are roughly twice as likely to be renters than white households. And in 2018, 58.3% of Black households were renters, compared to 27.8% of white households. And prior to the pandemic, Black renters were also the most vulnerable to economic instability. We have the lowest incomes, the fewest assets, and the highest unemployment rate among all racial and ethnic groups. And this lack of assets and savings are most important since it's what most families rely on to keep their homes through short-term economic shocks like a layoff or a health issue. Next slide. Prior to the pandemic, more Black renters reported difficulty paying rent than white renters. In this data from 2019, one third of Black renters often or sometimes had trouble paying rent, which was eight percentage points higher than white renters. Black renters were also more likely to be cost burdened across the U.S. 55% of Black renters pay more than 30% of our income on rent, compared to 43% of white renters and fully one-third of Black renters are severely cost burdened, meaning we pay more than 50% of our income on rent. Next slide. Black renters experience much higher rates of housing instability than white renters. For example, research from the ACLU using data from the eviction lab found that Black renters had evictions filed against them at more than twice the rate of white renters in Massachusetts. It's worth noting here that before the pandemic hit, an average of more than 2 million evictions were filed each year across the U.S. 
at a rate of four evictions every minute. I wanna say that one more time, at a rate of four evictions every minute. I'll note here that evictions filings in a normal year in the US exceeded the rate of foreclosures during the height of the foreclosure crisis. And renters have notoriously fewer protections than homeowners to fight evictions. Next slide. This brings us to our current moment in time. Next slide. I'll start with two sobering statistics that might explain why we see these disparities worsening during COVID. We know that Black and Latinx workers are overrepresented in industries that have been hardest hit by the pandemic and shelter in place orders. This is especially true for Latinx families. 57% of Latinx families lost jobs, work hours, or work-related income during the pandemic. Here, I'm showing the data from the Urban Institute's Health Reform Monitoring Survey from late March. More recent polling data from the Washington Post and other sources shows an even wider disparity. Next slide. This has meant skyrocketing unemployment rates for Black and Latinx workers. Both groups already experienced higher unemployment rates than white workers before the crisis and now are experiencing historic highs. These numbers mask another reality as well, which is that Black and Latinx workers are also both overrepresented in industries that were deemed essential workers, as well as in low-wage jobs, which means that for Black and Latinx families that were not laid off, they were more likely to work in high-risk, low-paying jobs. Next slide. Finally, we are seeing this reflect in higher rates of exposure to and deaths from COVID across all age groups. It's like the perfect storm. Overrepresentation in high risk, low paying jobs, overrepresentation in impacted industries, disproportionate lack of access to preventative medicine and healthcare concentration in densely populated living conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. So what does this all mean for the housing disparities that we discussed earlier? All signs suggest that the pandemic is making them worse. Next slide. When we look at the Census Household Purse Survey, which is one of the only sources, frankly, right now, a real-time data we have on renters and rent payments, and found a striking difference by race and ethnicity as to who was caught up on rent in October. Here we see that 26% of Black renters were not caught up on rent payments, while only 10% of white renters were not caught up. And data from that same survey found that a higher share of Black and Latinx renters were not confident that they would be able to pay rent in November. Now, there isn't yet reliable data on evictions by race during the crisis. But in light of the prior disparities in housing instability and the numbers we're seeing on rent payments through the crisis, we expect that Black and Latinx renters are at a much higher risk of eviction as moratoria are lifted. Next slide. One useful tool that we wanna share with you to see data for your region is Urban's Tracking COVID-19 Effects by Race and Ethnicity tool. The tool uses data from phase two of the Federal Household Pulse Survey public use files to measure how COVID has affected U.S. adults and their households. You can use this tool to understand racial disparities in your community for things like previous mortgage payments, previous rent payments, and upcoming mortgage and rent payments. Next slide. So we talked a lot about the problem and connecting the dots on how we arrived at this sort of critical moment in time.
But I suspect the question on your minds, having sat in a seat similar to many of you, is what can regional leaders do to address racial inequities in housing? Next slide. Research shows that the most fragmented regions in the United States also have the greatest degree of regional and racial inequity. Strong, cohesive regional leadership helps guard against efforts to undermine racial equity and forms a baseline for reducing disparities and connecting residents with resources. So regional bodies like COGS, like MPOs overall, can collect research that documents regional inequities, establish and apply racial equity criteria to public revenue streams that fund things like affordable housing production, ensure meaningful community leadership and ownership of policies, promote double bottom line investments, and integrate people and place focus strategies. Next slide. Now let's delve into some specific policies and practices that regional governing bodies can deploy. And keep in mind that these should really be contextualized and tailored to the specific needs of a region's population and should be targeted towards the most acutely experiencing housing inequity. Next slide. To reduce housing instability and resident displacement, regional councils can pursue approaches like supporting member jurisdictions in the adoption of rent stabilization and rental assistance programs, promoting housing voucher utilization across a region rather than within one's public housing authority's jurisdiction, and supporting the development of things like community land trusts. Next slide. Another tool from Urban that we want to share with you is the Emergency Rental Assistance Priority Index. This tool brings together measures of housing instability, COVID impact, and racial equity inequity to guide decisions. The index emphasizes an equitable approach accounting for risk factors that are higher for certain groups, particularly Black, Indigenous, and Latinx renters. And as we mentioned earlier, these groups have been historically and systematically excluded from housing and economic opportunities and face greater health and economic impacts from COVID. Local decision makers like yourselves who want to prioritize an equitable COVID response can use the tool to inform community-based processes to target areas where resources for residents and nonprofit organizations are likely to have the greatest impact on reducing housing instability and homelessness. Next slide. Regional councils could also focus on enabling fair and equitable access to housing. For example, regional bodies can provide sample language to local jurisdictions to expand anti-discrimination protections, support fair housing education programs, and intentionally increase testing and enforcement of fair housing laws. Next slide. Finally, but certainly not least, Funding for proven strategies that address homelessness is essential. Period, and stop, essential. Next slide. We realize that the recommendations we've made don't exist in a vacuum. And policymakers and practitioners on the ground in communities often have to figure out how to implement programs in a way that is mindful of the diverse needs and wants of a region, which is larger than a single group or a community. Trust me, I worked in an incredibly diverse county where I was trying to meet the housing demands of 88 very different cities. So I know it can be difficult to rally popular support and consensus around these type of policies, but there are proven strategies that can aid in success. And Gabrielle is gonna talk a little bit about those. Great, thank you, Monique. So uh, next slide, please. One powerful example of building consensus around equitable systems change is found in Utah. According to the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, when it comes to regional coordination around growth issues like housing, the United States can see a less developed tradition than many other countries, in part 
because regional planning efforts can evoke really strong reactions from residents concerned about losing local control. Envision Utah was an organization identified by HUD as a leader in this field by tapping into people's shared values and aspirations while using convincing unbiased data to demonstrate the need to work regionally. Good data and analysis, rigorous, transparent, and easy to understand, formed the foundation of Envision Utah's consensus building strategy. Before getting people together to talk about planning, whether for the region or for one of their many demonstration projects, Envision Utah does significant background work, baseline analyses and predictive modeling of land use, infrastructure, economic health, and other factors. Armed with a data-driven forecast of how the region will look in 40 or 50 years, if current trends continue, Envision Utah queried people's level of satisfaction with the region's future. Participants' typical response was dissatisfaction, which created the space to have productive conversations that transcended traditional ideological divides and focus on specific problems and trade-offs. In this region, people's shared values often outweigh their disagreements, and a shared knowledge base created through strong, unbiased data enabled people to reach a surprising level of consensus. This approach was key to their, their success in building consensus throughout the Salt Lake City region around transit-oriented development and housing. Next slide. So this, once again, brings us back to data. Racially disaggregated data articulates and makes clear the need for varying investments across regions, united under a common goal of racial equity, while also recognizing that the path to pursuing equity will look different for every region. Timely, reliable data are essential for de designing race-conscious solutions, as well as for holding decision makers and institutions accountable for choices that perpetuate oppressive systems. Next slide. So a new initiative we are really excited about is the Racial Equity Analytics Lab, or REAL. Urban's multiracial, multigenerational REAL team operates at the intersection of data science, social science, and public policy. We conduct innovative research across a variety of issues to produce data tools and evidence-informed analysis that respond to real-world needs and near-term policy choices. Whenever possible, our experts deliver data disaggregated by race and ethnicity at the regional, city, and neighborhood levels. And as we learn and share new insights, we are also cultivating an ongoing dialogue with equity-focused leaders who appreciate the power of data to help drive change. And with that, I'll turn it back to Monique to wrap us up. Thanks, Gabriella. Next slide. So what are the main lessons from our work? First, Rigorous, clear data is an essential tool to build coalitions for racial equity in housing. Second, creating space for flexibility and creativity to truly build a contextualized analytical approach to racial equity that fits the unique nature of communities is essential. Third, it's clear that COVID has worsened racial inequity in housing, as well as in other areas like health. And it is an urgent point of focus for all communities, whether urban, suburban, or rural. And finally, in order to provide the resources necessary to keep people safely and stably housed, regional entities need to commit to racial equity, even when faced with opposition. Next slide. And with that, thank you so very much uh, for your time and for the opportunity, and we will move into Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you so much uh, for this presentation. Um, this is really wonderful information, and um, it's, it's interesting here in California, uh, our local assembly member, Chu, um, initiated and with our participation, passed the bill uh, AB 1487 last year to establish a housing authority here in the Bay Area to allow us to do all of these things that you've talked about, rent stabilization tools, how do we preserve and, and uh, protect and produce more um, 
in for more housing for everyone. And so uh, we, we've got a lot of those things going. We haven't got a financing source yet because COVID took that away from us. We didn't dare put that on the ballot this year. We didn't think we stood much of a chance, but we will be working on that. And we are aggregating money from corporate folks and from uh, big trust funds to kick that off and, and get it started. And so it's, it's, a, um, it's a real process and you're right. It, it must be very thoughtful. It has to be carefully considered. And we have to be responsive to the individual communities throughout our Bay Area here in California, as we do in any big metropolitan area. But it's not just the big cities that have this problem. This is everywhere. Um, so now we want to open the webinar to your questions and comments. As a reminder, there's a questions box in the panel uh, on your screen and enter them so that the urban staff can respond. If you have a comment about some of the information presented today, please add your comment to that box as well so we can share that. And I'm going to turn this over to Macy Moran so, so she can um, handle the questions from the audience. And we will go until about five minutes before the hour and um, then we will wrap up. So thank you again for your presentation. Thank you. Macy? Great. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Gabrielle and Monique, too. That was a really interesting presentation. And we're so lucky to have you today on a Friday. I know it's not an easy webinar day. And right before the holidays, too, that's a double whammy. But we appreciate all the time that you've spent with us so far. Um, but as Julie said, we have plenty of time left for questions. So please feel free to send them um, our way and we'll get to them uh, probably. Yeah, I, I mean, we're we're got a few questions up on the docket here. Um, the first one, I'll just go ahead and get out of the way. Um, somebody asking if a recording of the webinar will be available. And I will say yes, along with the PowerPoint presentation. Um, since it is a Friday, I might actually wait to send it out on Monday. That way uh, it doesn't get lost uh, over the weekend in the weekend emails. I'm sure we'll put it on our website too. That way, if you go to narc.org, N-A-R-C, uh, dot org. We'll have it there and you can uh, find it and watch it. Uh, it'll be up on our YouTube page as well. So um, now that we got that out of the way, first question, how can an MPO, Metropolitan Planning Organization, that is mainly funded by federal transportation dollars, uh, do more work on equitable housing policy? Uh, beyond the housing recommendations, uh, whoa, it just moved. <laughs> Let me see. Um, beyond the housing recommendations in the long range plan. Do you wanna go first, Gabriela? Sure, yeah. So for MPOs that are primarily funded by federal transportation funds, um, I think something that can be really useful is di like digging into the environmental justice analyses that MPOs are already doing for transportation specifically, because those often have a lot of insights about housing instability. Um, and where uh, communities that are particularly disinvested in are concentrated. So I think that's a good way to center action um, and really make the most of those uh, federal resources and the actions that have already taken place. Uh, Monique. Yeah, I would add to, um, if I was um, in MPOs, I would partner too with the local jurisdictions that are included as part of the MPO, particularly ones that might be overseeing like CDBG funding or economic development funding because they have to do um, larger regional SEDs or community economic development plans. And as part of those plans, often they're looking at issues of equity and other issues. So you all, you may be able to almost piggyback on some of those existing resources to be able to augment some of the things that the MPO would like to look at as well. Great, thanks. Um, next question. Uh, are a lot of these regional entities local, such as at the county level? And in what ways do federal efforts support or drive these regional initiatives? Well, that's a good question. 
I mean, I would, I'm assuming that um, uh, entities, and I, I guess I assume the question is or, or sort of our COGS, our MPOs, are those type of entities, um, local entities, and they do tend to be local but regional entities that may be inclusive of multiple counties or inclusive of multiple jurisdictions. Um, and then the funding typically is coming, actually can be state, local, or federal funding that is coming to the jurisdictions. Um, and then I, I can't speak directly to sort of how the COGS or MPOs are funding. That actually might be a really good question for NARC. Great. All right, next question. Um, how do you anticipate MPOs uh, are COGS, I think that's uh, rural councils of governments or regional councils of governments and other regional housing conveners utilizing the real tool? Oh, that's a great question. Gabriella, do you want to start? Ah, uh, yeah, absolutely. So I think what's really exciting about real is that it's focusing across domains. So it's looking at housing, but also going to have these data and research tools that are on health, on education, on infrastructure. Um, so, you know, these regional entities using that real time data and using that really wide breadth of data to, to then find the specific kind of points of influence that they can have for their counties to make really meaningful investments or changes in pursuit of equity, I think is really exciting. Yeah, I think tools like the ones that real um, are going to be pushing out and then also some of the tools that we share with you. The great thing about them is being able to use the tools to really understand from a demographic and data perspective. What are the inequities in your community? So, for instance, we talked a lot about, you know, um, African Americans and Latinx households, but it might be indigenous households in your community. It might be youth from a homelessness perspective in your community. So using tools that are disaggregated and with disaggregated data in this way really allow you in your communities, in your regions to begin to look at where are the disparities? Where are people disproportionately impacted? And then begin to do planning based on that with real data to augment your efforts um, around advocacy for making certain investments in programs and policies. Definitely. And I think especially for the data sets that are on the smaller scale, so like neighborhood level, census tract level, block exactly. level, you know, when you really see that nuance in between communities, I think that's a really great, a great point as well. Yes. Great. Really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, next, this is just a quick follow up um, asking what real is again, if you can uh, let us know what that stands for. Yes, so that's the racial equity analytics lab at the urban Institute and we can drop a link in the chat. Yeah, please do. Um, that would be great. Uh, next question. The example from San Antonio is great, which is my hometown. So that makes me happy. Uh, can... is... Really? Oh, that's yeah, great. I'm actually in San Antonio right now. <laughs> wow. Well, there you go. Making connections, people. It's a small world. Um, so <laughs> can you speak more about the housing instability risk sub-index and what measures does it track? Renee, could you like to take this one first? Uh, actually, Gabriella, can you jump on it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the indicators on this one, so there's neighborhood level indicators. So that's looking at things like, um, I believe they have like rates of voucher use, they have, you know, just like general instability rates for housing or things that could be correlated with that. And then they also have an equity sub index. So that's looking at the factors that are like the demographics of the neighborhood or the census tract. Um, so whether that be the racial, economic, uh, gender divisions as well. And so then trying to find those points where we know there's more likelihood that people are going to be vulnerable and so we can predict those vulnerabilities looking at those intersection points of you know if we have a community that already has a high rate of housing instability in this community also happens to be predominantly black we know that this is probably an area where we're going to be needing to look to invest more funds to stabilize during the COVID-19 crisis great Thank you. Um, next question. Are you aware of any truly regional housing initiatives or partnerships? Uh, this particular person is looking for multi county models. That's interesting. I honestly offhand can't think of 
a multi-county model, although I have seen um, partnerships across counties to address issues of voucher utilization or um, housing instability. I wouldn't say it's a, a complete model, but for instance, I know Los Angeles County, because it bordered um, Keene County and some other counties, what it did um, to look at their services for vets, for instance, um, for something called VASH, which is the sort of voucher program um, for veterans, they looked at partnering to be able to allow vets to receive services in one service area, but be able to, net, to live in another service area. So I've seen partnerships like that um, to create a little bit more mobility and better um, services for clients, but not necessarily sort of a truly stand up of a regional housing initiative. But Gabriella, I don't know if you've seen any. Yeah, maybe not as explicitly of, as that, but I know that in the Washington DC region, the Washington Association um, has done a lot of collective um, research and advocacy around housing issues that are facing the district um, and also the surrounding counties in Maryland and Virginia. So that has definitely been a way that those counties have kind of worked to develop a cohesive narrative about what the housing issues are facing the DMV um, and working to fund research to fund um, that work that can stabilize the entire region. Yeah, that reminds me that um, Urban actually did some work, um, I want to say last year before, it was before I came on board, um, a, wa a greater Washington housing um, needs assessment. Maybe we can send that um, as a link um, to the NARC staff to share as well. And that was sort of based on the Metropolitan Washington COG um, here in the greater DC area, but included Virginia and Maryland. And I think overall the assessment looked at, um, so that actually might be a great model, looked at how to push sort of a larger, uh, more regional perspective for housing need, and then had sort of what each of the different regions needed to do. So you could understand because the approach in Alexandria, Virginia might be different than Silver Spring, Maryland, but thinking of your individual needs, but from a larger contextualized what the overall region needed. And so we can share that as a resource as well. That might be helpful. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, I think I think Martha just sent it, so I'll be sure to put it in the uh -huh. chat once I ask this next question. Um, do you have or know of strategies or tools that can assist in developing displacement avoidment uh, policies along with racial equity policies? That's a great question. Um, I There are actually a couple of tools at Urban um, around this too. I think we can we could maybe pull those together. I don't know if Martha will be able to do that um, as quickly around um, displacement and anti-gentrification strategies and measurement. Um, there's a displacement index or measurement as well. Um, I don't know, Gabriella, if you know the specifics of some of those, but I do know we have some tools that we can share. Yeah, we definitely, I know the tools you're talking about. Um, and I think also there's some really great tools from folks in our community engagement, kind of methods team and also community engagement research team. Right. Um, and I think when you're talking about displacement and gentrification specifically, having a really strong community engagement strategy that involves communities, not just in you know, the end product in a consultation kind of way, but more importantly, like help them co-creating the process of um, these policies, I think is really important as these are the communities that are really intimately experiencing the impacts of displacement um, and having them be co-creators of this, not recipients of it, is really essential. Yeah, good point. Let's see. Um, looking at the real tool, are the data primarily available uh, by state and then for the largest metro? Oh, I guess they said the data is primarily available by state and then the largest metros. But their question is, is the data available for smaller metros? Yes, the idea is that Real is actually trying to dig down, um, and it's still in development, um, but Real is trying to dig down to create to get disaggregated data as far down as it can. Um, now, there are limitations to data. It's one of the challenges and why um, Real, oh, thank you, <laughs> and why Real has been created and why we're exploring it, because the need to have the disaggregated data at more local levels, like a neighborhood level, a community level, um, is, is it's more challenging 
but it's needed in order to really be able to engage in that contextualized approach that we talked about. So um, in some of the data sets, they actually should already go down to um, a smaller level, um, but I, it is originally envisioned to bring it down as far as possible. Perfect. Okay, putting one more thing in the chat, guys. Sorry, I'm overwhelming you. Uh, this is the the cog example that um, I think many thank of you, you. will find helpful. Sure. No, thank Martha. She's the one that's sending it all to me. I'm just relaying the messages here. Um, let me see. I think there was one other question here. There are so many. Um, it says, uh, "Will you have data on discrimination based on gender identity or sexual preference?" Interesting. I don't, Gabriella, do you know? I don't know specifically for real, um, also because it's a relatively new initiative at Urban. I think it launched last month, um, but there are colleagues of ours in the Metropolitan Housing and Community Center who are focused specifically on uh, discrimination for people who are gender oppressed and also um, for uh, on the basis of sexual orientation. So that work is definitely, there's a lot of lines to be drawn, um, especially for queer people of color. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, someone said, thank you for this. The presenters provided a lot of great data resources. Um, do you have resources that help assess or relate the effectiveness of individual planning and policy tools, such as tenant protection, zoning tools, community land trusts, etc., cetera, uh, with meaning meaningfully improving outcomes at scale? We actually have a, um, a, a significant amount of research actually on all three of those areas. Um, poor Martha, I don't know if she'll be able to get the links pulled up that quickly, but you know, maybe if you could provide us um, that list, we can actually go back and pull together a nice list of resources that we can share with you that you can push out um, when you share um, the larger uh, recorded webinar, but there actually we do have a variety of resources, particularly around the zoning piece, um, as well as sort of evaluation in terms of program policy and what's been successful, um, and also evaluation of other models and best practices that have been used um, nationwide. Fantastic, thank you. I'm, I'm sure all the information you can send, uh, people will be really happy to see that. Um, great. Well, I don't see any questions here. There's, uh, there were a lot of questions. That's great. Thanks guys for uh, being such good sports and for those who submitted questions. And of course, if you have any follow-up questions, I'm sure Gabriella and Monique and Martha and the rest of the urban team will be happy to connect with you offline. Um, but for now, I'm gonna post a couple more things in the chat. And then in the meantime, I'm gonna turn it over to Julie uh, to close this out. Thank you, Macy. And let me really thank you both, Gabriella and Monique. You have been inspirational. You've been enlightening. You're giving us some of those tools. This is such a big issue to try to wrap our hands around. And I know we're in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. You would think that we would be further ahead than we are, but money is the big issue. And so, um, resources to actually accomplish some of this when when building affordable housing is so expensive particularly in a region like ours um, this is this is a struggle that we all have so i will be pushing out the recorded version of this webinar to my uh, colleagues at abag as well um, so that they can have all the resources that they can get at their disposal so as a reminder for all of you online, this webinar, like all of our NARC webinars, will be available on the website. And um, I think I heard Macy say also on a YouTube site that I didn't realize we had. So that's cool. And finally, if you have any questions about the presentation, you can reach Gabriella and Monique at the email addresses, I think, that are on the screen, although I don't see them. Um, uh, and finally, if you have suggestions for other webinars addressing equity, please contact Neil Bomberg at neil at narc.org. And thank you all for joining this webinar. We are now concluded. I'm going to talk just for a second so you can screen capture the, the uh, contact information there for Monique and Gabriella. So thank you for all joining us. Uh, please stay safe and healthy. 
And please accept all of our best wishes for a happy Hanukkah, Christmas, and a happy new year. And please may COVID be over in 2021 sometime. Hopefully next Christmas, we can all be together. So thank you all so very much and have the great holiday season. Thank you. Thank you so much.